Helldivers 2 is massively successful, and whenever something is successful, what follows shortly after is envy, greed, and confusion. And we've seen it before, we saw it with Baldur's Gate 3, we saw it with Pal World, developers getting angry, publishers being confused. But this time it's different, because as much as we saw this sort of stuff with Baldur's Gate 3 and with Pal World, those two games are very different from Helldivers 2. The sector of live service games that Helldivers 2 belongs to is one where games are meant to fail. I genuinely wish I were making this up. Companies chase live services because they want that consistent revenue stream, and it's worth it to try and make four, six, ten, or in Sony's case a little while ago, 12 different live service games. And that's because according to them, all you need is one or two to be successful. That'll cover for all the losses produced by your absolute failures. And live services are an area where you either thrive to the top or get quickly shut down. Sony had 12 live service games in development. They reduced that number down to six. And Helldivers was just another one of them. We've seen companies chase the live service goose over and over and over again, and we've seen them fail. Skull and Bones and Suicide Squad very recently, but look at everything else. From Anthem to Hyperscape, it's an incredibly cutthroat sector, to the point that these games are sent to die. Companies so far have been following the shotgun approach. We put out 10 games, and let's hope that one of them is successful. And my problem with that, and what Helldivers 2 proves wrong, is that that approach seems to be like they're trying their luck. Let's just see what happens. Doesn't matter if it fails, just let it die. All that matters is that one of them gets lucky. But Helldivers 2 isn't successful because it got lucky. That's what's gonna make everybody mad. Helldivers 2 is successful because it does things differently. It's not this carbon copy with a changed skin or changed genre of a live service coming out over and over. It does so many things differently. Its microtransactions are not predatory, its battle passes are not time-gated. It actively tries to stop FOMO by telling you, don't worry, these battle passes will still be here in the future, you can progress this whenever you want. And most importantly, it's a game that's made to be fun first, and then have extra stuff on it later. And that's why it's so important in the conversation, because we bundle Baldur's Gate 3, Pal World, these success stories all together but they're not the same. Baldur's Gate 3 was never meant to fail. Baldur's Gate 3 wasn't a shot in the dark in an overcrowded, oversaturated industry. Baldur's Gate 3 was a CRPG done with the budget of a big AAA game, a genre that big companies and publishers thought was dead. So the lesson that we learned from Baldur's Gate 3 is that good design, much like Taylor Swift says, never goes out of style, but it wasn't expected to fail. We didn't expect it to be this big, we didn't expect it to have this magnitude of success, but the people who had been asking for these sorts of games were always going to support it, they were always going to enjoy Baldur's Gate 3, it was always going to have a certain level of success, we just didn't expect it to be this big. Pal World is a lesson in iteration, in how you can take two different concepts, meld them together, and be competent at both of them with some really smart design that Pal World has that I still think is underrated. How they made a survival game with creature collecting elements, but by making the creature collecting integral to the survival game, it works. But it was never expected to fail. Pocket Pair knew what they were doing. They had already released a successful survival game before. It did decently. This is a genre where people normally check these games out and they either are great or not, but somebody always finds something to enjoy in them. It had a deal with Game Pass. It was going to work out one way or the other. We didn't expect it to be this big, but we didn't expect it to be nothing. And it's the type of game that if it had sold X amount of copies, it would have been profitable, it would have been great for the company and moved on. It didn't need to be huge to stand out. These are not the cases with Helldivers 2. This game is in a sector where you either triumph or fail, and the expectation is to fail. That is what everybody is betting on when live services come out, to the point that many people hear live service and just think dead game. Feast or famine, all or nothing, that's what this is. It's cutthroat out there, and all of these companies are trying to get not just a piece of the pie, they want to become the pie. So on paper, when you hear Sony is releasing one of their many, many live service projects, that's just a failure. 
So then, the next logical step is to say, oh, well, the shotgun approach worked. They got lucky. No, they didn't. They did things differently. Plenty of people have told me that my take that Helldivers 2 is actually going to impact the AAA industry is wrong. That it won't make a dent. That it won't make a difference. And I'm telling you why it has to. The success of Helldivers is one of rarity. It's a game made to be enjoyed, to be fun. That's rare in itself. It's a live service game that changes the model. That's rare in itself. And it's a massive success. And that is the biggest rarity of them all within that live service. And a lot of people keep saying that Helldivers 2 isn't doing anything new. It's just doing something that we wanted from before, just making a good game that we can enjoy, and that's not true. Helldivers 2 is combining that feeling with modern elements. It has battle passes, it has microtransactions, it is a live service designed to continue into the future, but it's doing all of that in a way that combines it with that feeling we used to get from when games didn't do that. It's actually doing what we've always wanted, which is a proper evolution of a normal multiplayer game into a live service that still captures that magic of just having fun, but it brings it in with the battle passes and the constant content and the microtransaction shop and all of these things. And that is noteworthy as well. There is no chance the people who have in their hands the investments of millions of dollars into live service projects that keep betting on them like they're just gambling are seeing this and they are asking the question why did this one succeed when my skull and bones when my suicide squads didn't and the things that you can point at of how they are different why it can succeed is because of that passion because of that design because of being a fun game first and having a microtransaction shop later because it takes a different approach that's healthier for this model. And if you're in the middle of developing the next Suicide Squad, you have to take notice. Otherwise, you're just not doing your job. You can't keep gambling on being the next big thing and wasting money and money and money. Why make 10 games to see if one of them is the next breakout success hit when you could develop 10 games that are all better games. That's going to increase your overall profit, and we know that money is the only thing that motivates these people. Because yes, the shareholders will also be asking, why is this game successful, and our six attempts failed? And they have to reach those same conclusions, because there's no other conclusions to reach. Coming to realizations like, maybe we shouldn't spend 50% of our budget on how to implement monetization and how to psychologically kidnap players into being trapped in our game to spend money and part of that on marketing and then only 50% of the budget on actually making a good game. Maybe we should be less worried about controlling how much of a good live service this is and how much of a good game it is. Maybe we should be considering that if we implement better practices that are healthy, the market is going to respond positively. Our consumers, gamers who just want to play a good game are going to reward us for that. And those questions right now are spinning and making a lot of people angry in a lot of very important rooms where conversations are being had. There is no way that you can actually claim to be doing your job if you're not looking at the situation and understanding the huge rarity that it is for a game that is this different to succeed in a market where it's considered so impossible that games are sent out to die. So this is a time to be happy. There's wonderful things happening in gaming, in very different areas. Like I said, as much as we like to bundle Baldur's Gate 3 and Pal World and Helldivers and a couple of other examples together, they all accomplish very different things. And for me, Helldivers 2 is the one that's the biggest blow directly to that AAA industry. Because Baldur's Gate just told people that if you're making single-player games, make them right. And Pal World just told people, hey, iterative design and good ideas, when executed competently, can lead to great success. But Helldivers 2 says something so much more important. The model isn't working. Change it. And these are things that I wrote for my big analysis of Helldivers 2. But in the end, when writing it, I decided that I wanted it to stand the test of time, to kind of breathe on its own. And while I talk about this in the video, I didn't want to get so much into the industry side of it and the actual reasons why 
it's going to work, why it's going to happen. A lot of people have told me that I'm just wrong, that I'm a hopeless optimist for thinking that this game will change things, and I disagree. I think that any company that doesn't pay attention to this and change things because of it are just straight up trying to lose money. Because now, for as much as the momentum has been building in our complaints with some of the things that AAA games do, now in the live service space, one that I am very familiar with, one that I care a lot about, we have an example to point at and say this is how you do it right. We rewarded this game. It was successful not because of luck, but because it did things how we want them to be done. We can hold it up and say, you didn't do what this game did. So your game, bad. Make it better. Do better. And eventually, because this might not happen overnight, right? There's a lot of projects that are going to come out that are going to suck. I'm going to turn on the camera, turn on the microphone and say, this is bad. You know what I preferred? The way Helldivers 2 did it. I preferred those battle passes more. Me, dozens of creators, people on Twitter, on Reddit, wherever you want. We're all going to say it. And there's going to be a crop of games that understood the good things that Helldivers 2 brought to the table. And when they implement it and they see success with it, everything will change for the better. I'm going to do my part and I'm going to enjoy games as much as I can. And I hope you do the same. Thank you for watching. Link to the big analysis that this was originally a part of in the description below. If you like this video, hit the like button. It helps more than you know. If you want more, subscribe to the channel. There's a lot going on in March. I have a couple of indie games to recommend very soon. And of course, we're building up to the launch of Dragon's Dogma 2. It's a game I want to cover a lot. Probably going to have a very big Helldivers update very soon. Tons of stuff. Subscribing is the best way to support the channel and you're supporting every video I do and hopefully something that is a little bit different than what we normally get here on YouTube. I've been Mug Thief, thank you once again for watching, and I'll see you again very soon.